We hope you enjoyed the exercise, the training outside. Um, I hope Virginia, where's Virginia? She's not in here yet. Um, she promises me she's okay. So um, let's make sure and, and congratulate her and thank her for uh, being the volunteer, the first volunteer to try the exercise. I know that a couple others uh, did build up the courage to do so afterwards. Thank you, Virginia. We are going to finish off our workshop with um, a very uh, wonderful speaker. Mr. Robert Sines is going to join us from Half and Associates. Half, uh, Mr. Sines is the Vice President and Civil Department Manager of Half Associates Incorporated. He's a graduate of Texas A&M University with a concentration in civil engineering. Robert joined Half Associates in 2001, bringing 15 years of experience. He has experience in civil engineering, planning, design, project management, and construction management for both public and private clients. Mr. Science has been uh, very instrumental in designing and constructing um, trail enhancement projects throughout the Rio Grande Valley and a couple in Austin. Um, most recently, he uh, and his um, company of Half Associates Incorporated assisted with designs for the city of McAllen, city of Harlingen, city of Hidalgo, and city of Port Isabel. Uh, and most of these uh, were the ones, the recipients for the TxDOT awards for bike and hike trails. So please help me welcome Mr. Robert Sines. And um, as she said, we're currently working on the uh, enhancement project for the city of Hardinger. So what I want to do today is kind of just put all the things you heard today, wrap that up into one basket and kind of give you an overview of uh, taking a, a hike and bike from start to finish and, and also look at how does that economically uh, help your community. So we'll go through them a couple slides. One of the things when you're looking at a, at a trail is you want to look at the value you're going to get out of it. And one of those value points is proximity. You want to make sure it's easy accessible to the folks in your, in your city, uh, county, or, or whatever your planning area should be. The other thing that you're looking at is what kind of experience do you get? You, you want to make sure that experience is, is very enjoyable, it's relaxing, you don't feel tense, you, you know, you're, you're getting something out of it. once the ride's over or the walk's over. Um, also, what type of use you're gonna get out of it. Uh, there's value in, are, are you gonna just be bicycles or are you gonna be bicycles from pedestrians, um, bicycle pedestrians and, and automobiles. You wanna try to get the biggest bang for your buck as well. One of the trails that we've worked on is uh, the Katy Trail in, in Dallas. And this trail, there's over 300,000 people that live one mile from this trail. So this is an an area that's highly uh, chased and looked at as far as uh, uh, quality of life. And what this trail has also done is it's increased the property values in that area up to 25%. And this is one of our uh, heavily used trails throughout the, the uh, Dallas area. Also what spurs off that is you start getting development, uh, 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 housing areas where people want to live next to it. So step out of your your house, you're straight onto the trail. It's, it's uh, just a quality of life experience. Another trail that we've been able to work on is uh, located in Austin. And as everybody's been saying, Austin's been really big on, on pushing uh, hiking bikes. And there's been a big push to the downtown area. One of that's the Lady Bird Lake Trail. Uh, there's been over 25,000 new residents in the last 10 years that wanting to move downtown. And I think it's just a difference in, in culture as well as you're trying to have these town centers where you have your restaurants, you have where you live, you, you can bike, it's easily um, accessible to bike to work. The other thing is they also, and from a cultural standpoint, they look at their uh, uh, multimodal centers where you may pick up a bus station or ride in on the bus station. That bus station has the ability to, to park your bike, you park your bike, you get on the, the um, the bus, ride in, or you ride your bike in because there's trails and there's areas to park your bike and you, where you feel safe and you can walk into work. So it's just a different thought process, but it's catching. Even here in the, in the uh, 
McAllen area. This is the second street bike trail, which I had an opportunity to work on. Uh, it's one of those things, you build it and they will come. You get instant gratification when you uh, build a hike and bike. So there's been a lot of talk about politics. When you're talking from a political standpoint, it, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of money. I mean, yes, there is some cost associated with it, but the value you get from your constituents is unbelievable because it gets used 24 seven, seven days a week. Um, just through, the, through the, all the different um, talks that we've been talking about is trails and greenways, they definitely impact the health of a city. So if you have a viable trail, it's gonna help you both your, your financial bottom line as a city, as well as help sustain the quality of life. The proximate principle, which is uh, developed by Dr. John Crompton, Texas A&M, Giga Maggie's. Um, one of the things is you want to be close to trails, and, and there's been studies on that, and with that being close to trails, the closer you are, the higher the property value is. And there's, we'll go through a couple studies that show that, and that's, uh, that this theory does hold up. So we'll look at being adjacent to, the, to a, a trail or park system and moving out up to 600 feet. And so we'll look at direct versus indirect. And the direct is 600 or less feet and um, outside that, that 600 foot circumference would be indirect. Uh, planning's been around a long time and also the thought of increased value happens when you're adjacent to a park or trail uh, something that brings quality of life and this is nothing new so we're, this has been going on since 1868 Frederick Law Home Olmsted he is the like founder father of landscape architecture and also it's been carried on with his son in 1919 and he was responsible for building the Yosemite um, Park uh, even here in Texas Riverside is a this is an old 1900 uh, city map this, this city is located outside or northeast of Huntsville. They took into account these greenways, these trails, to keep that quality of life. They wanted the individuals within these subdivisions to be able to experience that. And as you can see on the side, that, that's what it looks like today. Okay, so surveys have been taken and it shows that people are willing to pay more to be closer to a park or a trail. In 2001, the National Association of Realtors, they, they had a 50% response and 10% would, would, they would pay 10% more on their property in order to be closer to a, a trail or park. Uh, this is just a graph, kind of shows 10% uh, would not pay anything. Uh, it jumps up to 30% would pay 10%, a little less than 10%, 11 to 20, another 30% and just carries on. So there has been studies, it has been documented, people will pay a premium to be close to a trail or park facility. One of the towns that take this thing really serious is Round Rock, which they did a case study from 1997 to 2008. And what they looked at is that direct versus indirect. So if you were within that 600 foot radius of a green area or park, or park uh, did that add value to your property? Uh, uh, in um, Round Rock, it came out to be that 52.6% uh, of single families live within 600 feet of a trail or park. So they have had a plan in place and they've taken this very serious and have tried to implement it over the past 10 years or 20 years. This map just kind of shows uh, uh, the green areas represent the, the trails and park areas. So. They took it serious enough where if you look around the entire uh, perimeter of, the, of Round Rock, a subdivisional area. Just another drawing of that just shows that there is access throughout the city. So what the study resulted in is in 1997, uh, values near the parks and linear spaces was $125,000 for home average cost. And then in 2008, that increased up to 223. Similar with outside is 124 up to the 183, but at the end of the day, it's 21% it's increase in cost 
that, that you would re get back from your investment if you live closer to a park. So it is worth it to a city to have that type of, a, of, of investment in it because in turn that's revenue, sales tax revenue or property tax revenue for them. This is just a graph that kind of shows that as it's escalated up since two, 1997 to 2008. There's, and that's the 21% differential. This graph just kind of shows the closer you are and just uh, substantiate what I'm telling you is that the closer you are to a park or trail facility, the price of your house increases the value of it. So that's, the green lines represents the 200 feet and the, the bottoms is beyond outside the 600, so it, it drops significantly. Round Rock even took this a step further and they looked at a subdivision internally. Um, it's called Stone Canyon Firm Bluff Subdivision. It has several trails and parks and this is just a picture of a few of those. And if you look at one of their subdivisions, it's very dense as far as it goes with uh, park areas and trails that interconnect. So you've been talking a lot about connectivity. This, this subdivision has that and that's what you want to have. You want to have a starting point and an end point to every trail. This uh, study showed that in 1997, um, the difference then was 142,000 for within 600 feet and outside that 600 feet was 111,000. So there was a 27% differential. So there is value even in 1997. And then in 2008, again, the 21% uh, differential. There, so people will pay that premium and it is documented. So out of the 2,000 properties within the 600 feet, there was an average premium that people will pay of $20,000. So what does that mean to you as a city or an entity? That means you're gonna gener generate additional revenue. Um, in this case, back in 09 and 10, the, the sales tax rate was 39 cents per $100. That generated $159,000 back to the city just by uh, improving the quality of life. This is another trail that we worked on. It's um, the Hidago Hike and Bike. And uh, connectivity has always been one of the main things that they'll talk to you when they're reviewing your plan. They wanna know where's a starting point and where's an end point. And, and in between, they wanna make sure you're picking stuff up. They wanna make sure your access to schools, museums, uh, subdivisions, commercial areas, uh, any type of shops. Um, intermodal facilities so they you got to have a big picture and in this case our, our one of our destination points was the pump house it was a an easy sell and because um, we have a uh, we were also involved in the renovation of this uh, this park so it's a destination point for bird birders they'll ride their bikes all along the trail and end up this area and, and look at their birds uh, a key focus is you want to have to do before you get started is to do a master plan because you want to, the way, how should I say, in the valley, it's always uh, what's mine is mine. And so cities kind of don't talk. And so to rank really high, if you have a regional approach, you'll scoring as far as funding goes, you just go straight to the top. So you're not competing against each other. We've tried that and there's kind of an overall plan here in Hidalgo where it ties Edinburgh, you'll tie at this point, and McAllen, you'll tie at this point. And, and what you do inside your, your city limits is kind of your own thing, but um, that's about as far as it's gotten. So city of Edinburgh, um, McAllen, Far, San Juan, and Mission, and Hidalgo. They have all are talking, but it's not, not as in a regional approach. And that's one of the things that I, I strongly urge that we keep pushing toward because dollars are limited and the bigger the, 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 uh, the support is, the higher up we'll move. So by having this linkage, we need to have a strong spine system that connects from point A to point B in each of the towns and we need to know what everybody's doing. Um, one of the ways that you're gonna do that is develop a trail master plan. This is your roadmap. This kind of shows you what you're gonna do and you wanna do it citywide, regional wide and even statewide if it gets to that point. This is just some drawings showing what we do as far as looking at the different alternatives and different links that we're trying to hook up. 
GIS is one of the tools that we'll utilize. It'll show uh, property zoning, it'll show uh, values, it'll show type of land use. So we utilize this information to develop our corridors. So the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll lay out a schematic and show the different segments. And what this is showing is we're going from the, I guess that's why, the, the uh, birding center, nature center. We're tying some schools together as we come along. We're going to TSTC and we're going to downtown um, Harlingen. So there's some museums and high schools. So there's a lot of users. So we could substantiate that this is a, a viable project and will be utilized. The process of doing a master plan, some of y'all may know it, some may not, so I'll just kind of brief over it. But this is your meats and potatoes. This is what's going to sell the project. And also, you know, there's been talk that hiking bikes, some, you can just throw a little bit of paint. Well, sometimes that little paint ends up needing a retaining wall or it needs a, a bridge structure. And when you do an enhancement project, you kind of go in saying, I'm going to do it for this amount and I'm going to do this scope. Well, if the price goes up and you didn't catch that within your scope, you're on the hook. So the city entities will have to flip the bill for that. So you need to do your due diligence. And the first thing we would do is get boots on the ground, both with city staffs, with the outreach uh, folks, with uh, any committees, and walk the trails or walk different opportunities and identify the, the pluses and, and the weaknesses. Then we would do an analysis. We'd take that, that information and kind of lay it out and say pros and cons from an engineering standpoint and look at uh, the hydraulics and hydrology. We look at utilities. You know, is there power lines that can be moved or gas lines, in, gas lines that impede the, the way? Um, tech stock, you got to talk to those folks because if you're crossing their facilities, you got to make sure you're not doing mid-block crossings. So you try to identify all those issues and as well as when you go for an enhancement project, they look at it as a mini highway project. So something you would say, no, it's just a sidewalk, and you could probably draw from point A to point B and it'd take you one sheet. Well, that one sheet ends up being about 50 sheets because you do it by the pound. You have to go through an archeological, environmental, uh, you have to do sign and striping. So it's a mini highway since it is moving, um, via, well, it's, it is a mode of transportation. So you have to follow their guidelines. Alternatives, we'll look at several alternatives. We'll say, you know, does this make sense? Does this alternative B make sense? And we'll make presentations to councils, to, to work groups, and we'll get a consensus. And from that, we'll refine the alignment and develop costs. So then we know what we're going to the bank with. After we do um, our cost analysis and we've got an alternative, we'll make that recommendation, and that's what we're going to move forward with. So at the end, you have a product that you can take for um, enhancement grants, uh, local CDBG grants, so that parks and wildlife grants. There's opportunity, once you have that plan in your hand, that you can just shotgun your attempt to get additional fundings. Uh, just going through the analysis process, what we'll do is we'll utilize GIS, we'll identify all the different areas as far as green areas and look at potential areas that we can lay our corridors. Uh, it may be the roadway systems, it may be areas that the city owns where we can go through green areas. So we try to identify that to minimize the impact as far as uh, obtaining property because that's a substantial cost when you'd have to go and acquire property. We'll, we'll lay out uh, potential alternatives and thoroughfares where we can make some connection points where how do you get from the streets actually to the the green areas or the trails and vice versa. Then we'll also look at the public lands like we talked to because there may be a birding facility that we want to touch on, there may be a, a butterfly garden or something that has significance to your area that we want to make sure that we, we make a destination and make part of the connection. Another thing we'll look at is neighborhoods. We want to identify all the neighborhoods in the area so that the alignment we lay out maximizes the impact as far as access to it. We want to make sure that you can get from point A to point B in a relatively within that 600 feet. Makes sense? Because then you get the high use. Lastly, we'll look at land use. Um, we want to just know what the types of it is. Is it a park? Is it a bus facility? Whatever. 
and uh, we'll label that so it helps us define our alternatives. And then we'll put zoning and ultimately we'll come up with some different alignments. So once we have all that information in hand, then we start laying out the trail. So it is time consuming. Um, once we have we, the alignments are evaluated, one will fall out and we'll select one. So, and then we'll go with it. So now you have your spine infrastructure in place. Now you need to think of what are you gonna build? Well, typically uh, your spine infrastructure is, is the one that will be the largest through, like from city to city or from east to west, north to south and you'll have connection to it like 10 foot wide trails, a 6 foot wide trail or depending on what you have. It could also be just you're tying in with a bike lane and sidewalk. So, But this would be your spine and roughly a 12 foot concrete trail runs 300,000 to 750,000 per mile. And that's all dependent if you have a, a bridge of that nature or box culvert or some significant utility that you have to adjust. So you want to come up with a, a ratio that meets the requirements of your city. And in this case, for Katy, they, um, they look 12 foot wide. For every mile, they want it three, to pick up 3,500 3, residents per mile. And for the 10 foot connector, since it was a little smaller, you can reach out a little more. It's 2,650 residents per connector. And the six to eight, which you typically see here, because we try to make our dollars stretch, it's a uh, 17.50 per mile. Uh, so with that being said, you'll need like if you had a population of 135,000 people uh, on your on in your area, you would need 39 miles of trail today. But you kind of want to project that out so that this plan's a living document. You would need 43 miles in 2020, 45 miles in in 2030. And just similar, you can just read that. But you're starting out with 51, ending up with 60 on the 10-foot connector, and 78 miles, ending up with 90 on the um, secondary trails. Eight-foot trail is comfortable. Six-foot, it's a little tight. It's doable. The minimum that you're allowed to do for enhancement projects is six-foot when it's shared use. So keep that in mind. You need to make sure you have the right-of-way, and if you have an, a five-foot sidewalk or a three-foot sidewalk, you're going to have to widen that out in order to make it comply. Um, talking about um, how do we make this work and, and thinking out of the box, well, one of the things you can do is when you start looking at some of your ordinances, you implement that as far as your development. You look at it as any roadway project, you're going to implement hike and bike trails, and, and you, there's some type of donation possibility. And then the other opportunity is Utilities, when you have high-rise power, or back up, when you have high-rise uh, electrical lines running through your neighborhoods, great opportunity for a corridor to use your um, hike and bike trails, and they'll let you utilize those trails. Doesn't cost you anything. The only thing you need to do is make sure you get a licensing agreement. The last thing as a city entity you want to do is purchase property. You want to make sure they, they give that up. So it, that way your improvements go a lot farther along. Um, one of, okay, so once you have your trade corridors developed, how do we make sure we implement them? We implement them through roadway and utility improvements. That's part of it. So anytime you do a roadway project, a wastewater or drainage line improvement, you add the hike and bike component to it. Uh, some of these cases is going to require an ordinance to be adopted, as well as look at your landscape ordinance and see if you have that buffer that's required. And this is some ideas. This is a roadway project added on the hike and bike lane on either side. Another opportunity there. Just another one. So you can implement hike and bike trails as long as you can get it in your ordinance. And, and if that way it, it's in the, uh, the big picture and it doesn't get left out. Okay, so you have your plan in hand. Now let's use that plan to leverage for funding. We're gonna to try to get um, grants through partnerships with other cities. We're gonna to talk to TechStop, we're gonna talk Parks and Wildlife, we're gonna to talk to the feds, uh, Lower Rio Grande Council of Governments, uh, the MPO, different opportunities. Different, they all have different pots of money and they all have different criteria. So you wanna make sure within that master plan you encompass all the issues so that it can be utilized across the board. Uh, 
And then every three years, you it's a, should be a living, breathing document. If something's not working out, you want to be able to tweak it and just let that thing grow as, as time goes on. All, some of the conversations <laughs> I went through is like there's ownership of this trail. You got you got to feel it. This is you know McAllen. What makes me feel like I'm in McAllen? Well, when I drive McAllen, I see the little silver things that press their in whoever created it. It's, it, it's the trailheads, it's something different, it's like a, I really don't know what it is, but it's, they're, they're silver in nature, instead of having that, that yellow, um, this yellow post there, ever his, all his trailheads had a, a symbol there that was, uh, it was sculptured, and it, you know you arrived at a McAllen trail. Those were ballers, and, because uh, I worked on the trail. Yes, I remember. Um, the ballers, and, and each street has a ceramic top, that if it's uh, like if it's hibiscus, then there's a hibiscus on that uh, baller top. Right. And then I think it's because the McAllen is a city of palms. There's an outline of palms on each baller. Right. Down the side. So you got to be frou frou to understand that. I'm, I'm the straight lines. I, I just. Yeah. So it, it's a way of keeping traffic from entering in your trail. It says you've arrived at a at an intersection, <coughs> either. Get off your bike and get ready to hit the button or look both ways. But also it keeps traffic from driving into it. Because mostly, like in this bottom picture, this is a, a pedestrian bridge. You definitely don't want a truck driving over it. It's not meant for that. It's just strictly meant for bikes and, and pedestrians. Some of the obstacles when we go through that we'll look at, you know, how can we bring character to, to this picture? Well. We'll look at, you know, is it limestone in your area? Is it, what is it, what is it that sets you apart? Well, so this is a picture of, of a vision of what you can do. This is a visually enhanced, this is in the Dallas area. Um, and it's designed in a, in a way, let me go back. It's designed in a way where in the event you have a rain event, this area will be entirely underwater. But the trail will be, is designed so that it can uh, handle that. So. With the given time, uh, up to a week, two weeks, water subsides, trails back to normal. And the only thing you have to do is probably wash it down because there will be some debris. Just another, not so, not so plush, you can uh, bare bones it. One of the things you have to make sure is any drop-offs have this type of uh, uh, barrier. And as you can see, it's excessive, but that's the text dot way, so you have to do it. And here's uh, just a plan of, of that. You know, you'll go through some detailed design as you go through this process. It's not just uh, go out and paint stripe and do it. it. It goes through an evaluation, and that evaluation is, it's been, your drawings get looked at at the local level. They get blessed, then it goes up to division, which is in Austin. Then they get blessed, and then it goes to the Federal Highway. They bless it, and then you get your money and you go to work. This is some of the, the, the uh, issues that you'll come up against here in the valley. Is, um, either I don't have all that much money, I don't own the right of way, and there's a sidewalk, an existing sidewalk, and I want to make this a hike and bike trail or a shared use. One of the ways you can do it, and, and we've done it just because we've had to, um, is add on our six to eight feet to the trail. What this does is it, you feel a lot more comfortable riding or walking on this trail. Um, it, it's, um, you feel you're a little way, uh, further away from the roadway, so it's just more comfortable. Doesn't look that great, but it, it does survive. I mean, it does serve its purpose. The other option is runners, what I get out of it is a lot of the time is runners hate concrete pavement. I love concrete pavement. And the reason why I love concrete pavement is because I used to be a city engineer and a public works director in the big town of Alice. And one of the things that I didn't have was maintenance money. And with every roadway project or when you put pavement, you got a crack seal, you got to repair potholes, and it has to be every five years. You got to do something to it. And what happens in municipalities, you do nothing to it. You, all you got to do is walk around the mission trail over at Shup, you know, whatever that park is over there by the fire department, and you can see cracks, you'll see potholes. And you cannot compromise asphalt pavement, so uh, otherwise they'll just start failing. Concrete works and it lasts and it'll give you a long design line. This is taking it a step further, costs more, but now you have the opportunity to put landscape, green areas, benches, so you can start visualizing this. This is more of an experience 
you may want. Cost comes into play, maybe it goes to, to the sender. You know, you just do a, a compacted <coughs> granite or something of that nature. Still getting you what you want, but in an opportunity. The other thing we'll look at during analysis is crossings. TxDOT hates mid-block crossings. And the worst thing you can do is bring them a mid-block crossing and they're gonna turn you down. But you gotta kinda think out of the box because you got people, they're gonna come to this intersection and they're gonna say, I only gotta go 60 feet across to get to the other side. Well, what we're gonna tell you from a hike and bike standpoint, you're gonna have to go 400 feet to the intersection, cross at a light or at the intersection that's uh, always stop and then come back down. That's what I gotta tell you legally, but what happens in reality, you're just gonna walk across. So rail, each roadway crossing is very different, has to be handled different, and the look will be different. But at the end of the day, we need to make these things safe. I mean, from a hike and bike standpoint, I've been touched in my life of my admin, Roy Carlson, just a couple years ago, was hit and killed here in Edinburgh. So that's how close this stuff gets to me. So whatever I do, I envision my little kids riding this thing, so I want them to be safe, I want to make sure there's, there's, you have to put signage as well. Stop signs, uh, get off your bike, you know, hopefully you can read, but you will get signs that tells you <laughs> what you need to do and provide you wayfinding way of where you're going. This is one of the, it's, it's not, I don't believe this has been adopted by TxDOT, but it's called a hawk signal. And this hawk signal is strictly for mid-block crossings. It should be last resort, cities can adopt it, but it is a way of getting individuals from this side of the street to the other side of the street. And you're gonna pay about $150,000 for this light, which is real typical for any signalization. It runs between 100 and 150,000. Unless McAllen does it, then it's probably, what, 60,000 or something cheap. But um, this has only been utilized in a few areas. TxDOT will not allow it yet, but if you're using your own forces, your own money, something to consider because it, it, it's more real world. Trail access, we're talking about accessibility all the time. You want to make sure it's inviting. You can drive up to it to go to the park. There's parking areas. There's a place for your, um, your bikes to, to um, be uh, chained up and, and set while you go do your thing. And also the entrances. You want them to be real inviting. So that's when we talk about gateways. You, you're looking at a gateway. Let me just go back. That's what it would look, and you have to have some type of vision that, and this is what we would do. We would take all the, the crew, we'd have our off, you know, and our hard hats and our, our, our cameras in hand, and we would just start walking areas that we know and try to develop the trails and see what makes sense. And then this is what it could be, you know, at the end of the day. Something that says you've arrived at your city, some kind of signature. Special places, talked about that. You know, there's been a battle. There's an area where um, something of significance, a special tree, special ebony, something. You want to make out some areas along the destination as, as part of your connection point that you want to visit, invite them, so maybe a placard to read, something they can touch and feel. It's all about the experience. Also, talked about the community connection. We want to make sure we're tying all the cities together. You want to know when you left Edinburgh and when you picked up in McAllen, but we want to make sure that connection's there, but you also want to make sure that we're separate and we have our own identity. Um, trail identity, we talked a little bit about that with McAllen, but there's different ways you can do it. You can do it with bollards, you can do it with your gateways, wayfinding signs. Find your niche and, and utilize it and run with it. Uh, Interpretive features is just a way of uh, uh, along the trail. How do I jazz it up? You know, is there sitting areas? Is there exercise areas? And, and those exercise areas, I always see them, but I never see anybody using them. So I don't know if they're, they really, if it's worth your money to spend. But definitely I see people sitting down or, or utilizing the benches, um, water fountains if you have the opportunity. Most of these areas, when you start doing in town well, and you start doing landscaping, you got to think about irrigation and landscape. Um, so irrigation is a cost you got to do as far as putting it in the ground, as well as the uh, water costs and electric costs. Making this thing your trail 
a memorable experience is key, paramount. It's going to add values to your, your uh, property values. Your constituents are going to utilize it, and it, it's a long-term thing. Over 300,000 people live um, one mile from the trail. This is uh, in Austin, like we talked about, and it's so there are some success stories out there, and it's very heavily used. So closing that, it's just making it a, a trails, they're worth it. Uh, they're easy to cut. As Andrew said, you can just, from a, from a budgeting standpoint, that's the first thing to go. And, and it's every two years. So got to have a plan that makes sense and rises you to the top. Don't mess around by nickel and diamond on the bottom side. Kind of look at a regional approach. Make something that has a lot of... Um, pizzazz to it where you're tying schools, you're tying museums, you're, it makes it really, you know, uh, inviting to the guys reviewing it. And it's all about the reviewer. That, that closes my um, presentation. I'll open up with any questions or comments y'all might have. Do you know when TechStop will happen? Well, we just got this last round was a year ago, so it's two years out. It's usually every two years, depending on the feds, when there's, if there's money allocated for it. Robert, there's been a lot of talk about uh, a hiking bike trail along the canal system. What, 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 uh, what challenges do you see from an engineering, engineering perspective All right. um, with that? The, ch the challenges are making sure let me back up. Hidalgo, we had a similar situation. It runs around the lake, it runs around the levees, and the key is to make sure I have a buffer between the end of my trail and to where you go into the water. So I, I have to have the opportunity to get off the trail, fall down, or get off the trail and get back on. From the lessons learned, what I typically do is what I do in McAllen now is I, I put that white fence. It just, it, it provides a sense of safety to the kids. You know, I got kids, I don't want anything happening where it encourages them to go look at the water. I kind of want to keep them on the trail. What, what is the bike fence, what does that look like? It's that, it's that, um, white that white rail, uh, the three rail fence. It's, it's made out of vinyl. Oh, yes. okay. It's, it's kind of, it blends in. It's not real yeah. intrusive, yeah. so. Robert, uh, are you aware of any city, uh, or local ordinances that have been implemented to um, try to figure out how to get my writing to go on this. I'm sorry. Mark and I have been discussing for the last couple of years the idea of like when big box uh, development comes in, having some type of ordinance or code in place to where they contribute to a trail system, uh, something like that. Are you aware of any cities or any I, locales? That I, I can get that, and I know there's been talk about that, and it's basically an impact fee. So we develop a zone, and within that zone, that set-aside money goes to it. Currently in McAllen, it's parks. You either give up so much land or you give up so much money toward, toward the development. So I think that's getting utilized in McAllen in a way with the park system. Um, but I can get you probably some well, more news. Well, I asked about the trail just so everybody in the room sort of has an idea. Something Mark and I have visited on for quite some time with, and with some other people. It's like the uh, Super Walmart on Olana and now with the new beautiful... Uh, renovated McAllen Library there. It seems like there was a missed opportunity there along that drainage area to tie right in all the way up to Lark Community Center. You have an entire neighborhood there, uh, a large population of people who actually walk and students who walk right. to be able to provide access for them without having to get out on the roadway network to walk up to Walmart or walk to the library or ride to the Walmart or ride to the library. Because as it is right now, we have no bike system that connects to that downtown library. Mike, I don't, do you know, because I, I think there's a connection. I yeah. in McAllen, and there is a master plan Clint. on those drainage ditches where they, they've already done the, the cut down where the, where they're not just a big U shape, but they've got a platform. And the, the plans were to call when they get the funds to, to put trails all way and landscape that. But when it's flooded, it holds the water and it doesn't damage the trail. That's correct. Uh, but it, there is something supposed to go from Nalana all the way up yes. to the, the library area. And, and utilizing that drainage ditch. Someday. It's, it's, it's shell. It's shell. I mean, it's, I think the design's done. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, 
anyone else? Um, I just happen to be taking these over the library today. If anyone, if anyone would like to connect the museums in the four county region, I can give you a brochure so you know where all of them are. I know our last speaker here um, mentioned connected points like museums. I was going to add one thing, Robert. Um, he was talking earlier about the economic viability to adding a hike and bike trail. Um, I think because I was deputy director, I got the phone calls. Um, the Burger King that's on, I think it's Nolana and 2nd Street, there's a subdivision behind it that was run down and there were a lot of homes for sale. When 2nd Street Hike and Bike went through and we started landscaping it, you couldn't buy a home. They were gone and the property values went up. They improved the looks. Um, every subdivision after that was calling our uh, the parks department going, when, when are we getting a hike and bike trail? So just to, to give you a, an overview, and, uh, incidental, I guess. I mean, it's not a, a scientific survey, but it falls in. Um, home values went up. Everybody wanted their hike and bike trail. So the subdivisions that were coming in were asking for hike and bike trails. It's, it's real, it's worth the way, yeah. It's where every worth, every penny you spend, you will get value for that. It's just amazing how quick you get your return. I have a question. In some cities where Parks Department builds the trails, Public Works does the, the rest of the bike network, and frequently they're not really <clears throat> connected. Are you seeing a trend in the valley of the master plans, including the bike networks and the trails, or are they still looking at them like two different things? I think, I think with time, everybody's starting to soften up and it is starting to gel, but there's still that engineering, planning, you do your thing, I'll do my thing mentality. But with the <coughs> initiatives from the, the commissioners pushing it, it's getting more unified. Because most of the commissioners use it, utilize those trails. They, they run on them or they bike on them or they take their kids on them. So they see if there's a problem or not a problem, but they're starting to talk more. I see that. It seems partly it's because people are thinking of the trails mostly as recreational because they're indirect, because they're following a waterway or some natural feature, whereas uh, the road network obviously is where people need to go. But I think that transit is part of the secret to tying those together, that if uh, <coughs> transit's asking them questions, how do we tie into the trails and the bike network and that if everybody in this room makes sure everybody's talking at the table, right. they need to be a little bit pushed together. The thing that happened in Austin was the trails basically were given up by the parks to Public Works. So then Public Works finally started looking at trails as part of the transportation system, which they had not considered before. And so that seems to have helped. They became under one, um, one body. It's changing that mentality, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. I think that, if I, I'm sorry, I think that, and I, I, I preach this a lot just because of being a public outreach tool for transportation planning to the feds and back to the state, and that's really the focus of our job, advocacy. I think the people's voice, if you want it, really needs to be heard more. Um, and I, I'm embarrassed to say, we held just recently, and uh, Mark was really important on pushing it for us, a series of public meetings that we held all the way from Westlaco to Mission, some during the day, some in the evenings. Uh, there was a lot of advertisement that went out on it. A lot of the inf emphasis of it was some bike plans that we have. Um, our biggest turnout was here at UTPA and it was four people. Sad, isn't it? We, we do not get, and I mean we as an organization, we do not get the people who turn out at meetings or at, uh, you know, whether it's public meetings around uh, uh, and at forums to say this enough to us, for me to carry back to my bosses, which are the 21 elected officials of the cities and 22 in Hidalgo County, as well as the county commission. Uh, those are my bosses directly. Uh, Mayor Martinez in Alamo is my chairwoman. You know, when we have our, our, our policy meetings and we talk about, well, Andrew, what did you hear about this? We heard nothing. That's nine out of 10 times what we heard. Or it might as well be nothing, because when we tell them four, six, Right. 20 people out of a county of 800,000 turned out to say we want something or don't. That's not really having your voice heard about anything. That's not really trying to have any influx. So, you know, I, I invite people to become more engaged with us, with the cities, with the county. Uh, 
with your civic organizations. Mark does a fantastic job with Ciclistas Urbanos to make us aware of, you know, situations with parking lots, unattractive situations, you know, to get the word out there. But making you aware doesn't make you engaged, and you need to have that engagement if you really want to make those changes. Because otherwise, my elected officials that sit on my board think all anybody's worried about is the two minutes of congestion that they have at 83 and 281. And, that's where they're going to put all their money because nobody's hammering for a bike lane. They just want more right. roads on the express. And we see that also on the city side. When we come up with our plan, <coughs> we'll have a public hearing. We'll take it to the parks board, and nobody will show up. You know, and you're ready to spend two million dollars, and here's the plan, and there's nobody showing up. So, not a whole lot. Go, go ahead. earlier we're doing our annual Vita Verde Earth Day Festival in the Gallon, April 21st, Saturday. And if you believe in things like this and spreading awareness and educating the public, uh, we would love to have some representation from bicycling groups, bicycle shops, uh, transit, you know, green transportation, anything we can. We, we have the space for you if you'd be interested in uh, just teaching. We, we expect around 4,000 people, mostly from the Gallon and the Around the areas, so we'd love to have you come by and sort of be a, a sponsor in time for us. Um, you can contact Kingdom Mazatlan.com, or it's on there, or you can just ask me. Yeah. If there are, oh, there's another question. Yes, just a similar um, opportunity kind of thing. I teach in the English department here, but I'm teaching um, my writing classes in conjunction with our new environment. <coughs> Anyone who wants to sort of tell what's available in all of these different test banks to come visit my class, or if you want to let me know that you're available for emails from the students, because they just choose a topic that has to do with it, um, borderlands, environmental, and environmental justice issues. And so these are all the kinds of things that are positive kinds of things that they can say, hey, here's what's happening, here's what needs to happen. And that gets the word out to them because they spread it to their families. I'll, I'll add this to get started early because this process is about a three to four year process by the time you do your planning, your application and get plans. Before you break ground it's, it's three or four years down the road. So if you want to see something happen in the near future you need to get started today. Thank you Robert. This concludes our workshop for today. I do want to point out that today, as you've heard all the speakers um, provide the information on how cycling truly is an economic development tool, we hope that you will take that information and apply it, whether it's through awareness, through engagement, through your projects. But um, as you heard, our table of speakers here uh, towards the very end, the biggest issue um, is the engagement. We are trying really hard here at UTPA to create the educational awareness, but engagement is key. And tearing those barriers and making sure that we come up with a regional plan is very important. Um, we are very divided, and I will say it clearly, we are extremely divided. I have worked with several cities on several bike and hike trail plans and trying to bring them together. And at one point we thought we were, we were there. I know because I worked with, with Robert and at the very end they decided to split up. And so with that split, McAllen received some money and Harlingen received some money. But the plan was for it to be a regional plan so that we were connecting, making those connections as Robert mentioned. Um, it did not work. As Andrew mentioned, he has meetings every month and no one's showing up. So we need that engagement. We are creating um, this awareness so that we can ask you as citizens um, to please engage others and also bring them to the table. I know that all of you are here because you have an interest. You wouldn't have come 
to this workshop without having an interest in hearing our wonderful speakers. So please take this information with you and please extend it and encourage people to get engaged, to get involved. Thank you so much. We hope that you will join us again. We have our Save the Date, again, <coughs> all the dates uh, for the different events that are happening this month. We hope that uh, you will visit our website and our Facebook so that you can continue um, connecting with us and coming to our future workshops. They are not all on alternative transportation, but we still invite you to come because they still may be topics that may be of interest to you. Thank you again to all our speakers. Before you leave, we do ask that you please fill out the survey. The survey is very important to us. We do need you to be very, very honest. Um, these programs are brought to you thanks to the generosity of our sponsors and our generous speakers who have come from out of town and from their busy, busy uh, life uh, and workplaces to spend the time to share this knowledge and their expertise with you. Uh, so please fill out the surveys and if you are going to apply any of this information in any form, please let us know. Uh, that will help us extend these programs for future programs. Um, again, this program is not uh, funded necessarily through the university, uh, so we need your support in letting our generous donors know how this information is impacting the community. So if you will be applying any of the information, please let us know so we can share that with those wonderful and generous donors and sponsors. Thank you once again. We hope you enjoyed breakfast. We hope you enjoyed uh, lunch. And we hope you enjoyed all our wonderful speakers. Can I please have a wonderful round of applause for our table of speakers? Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for this great conference and the hard work that uh, Mary and I have yeah, been able to do. You know, I, I did not introduce myself, and I know that we have a lot of new uh, attendees for this workshop. My name is Marianela Quiroga Quintanilla, Director for Sustainability here at, at UTPA, but I need to give credit to my wonderful staff. Um, Weena Rutledge, who is our program coordinator, and Naomi Keith, who is our administrator and keeps us out of trouble. <laughs> Thank you to them because this wouldn't have worked out as smoothly as it did without their help. And our interns. Yes, we have our interns with us today. Rico, can you wave to everyone? Our student interns here at UTPA. Thank you.